Alright, so we are in cycle 13. This is chapter 18 continued. And everything that we've talked about up to this point um, in this chapter has been a pelagic ecosystem. So the mesopelagic zone and the deep sea pelagic regions. Um, everything that we talked about was occurring in the water column. This cycle we actually get to talk about what's going on on the sea floor. So it's what we call the abyssal plain. Imagine a big flat plain at the bottom of the ocean like Kansas. That is the abyssal plain. So this picture just simply shows you where the abyssal plain is. It's everything that's like in blue slash purple on this map and it is the largest habitat on earth and it makes up the majority of the deep sea. Okay, um, So most of the deep sea is an abyssal plain. There are other habitats down there like hydrothermal vents and stuff um, which we will talk about but most of it is the abyssal plain. So the food source for the abyssal plain is whatever falls from the photic zone and the main source of food for this region is marine snow. Okay, So everything that we talked about like in the epiplagic zone and all of that stuff um, that is the majority of the food source for the, the um, deep sea floor. And at this point marine snow is made mostly of copepod poop, mucus, and dead plankton. And it sounds disgusting but that's that's what it is. Um, and then you also have food that can come from like dead fish and whales that will fall to the ground. Um, so that's what we call large particulate organic matter. And then we also have bacteria. So bacteria will be found on the seafloor but it will grow very very slowly. So those are the three sources of food. Um, that will come from the photic zone. So you have those options or you can eat whatever swims by. Um, and actually animals that live on the deep sea floor they like these like larger animals that that die and fall to the ground because the particle size of the um, food that falls to the ground will actually determine its nutritional value. So if you have a larger piece of food that will fall faster to the bottom and therefore it will retain more of its nutritional value because it will have um, less opportunity to be eaten uh, and then pooped out on its way down. So it keeps more of its um, nutritional value. Whereas like marine snow, it, it falls very slowly so it has more of an opportunity to be eaten and then pooped out and every time it's eaten and pooped out um, its nutritional value decreases. So the larger the food size, the more nutritional value it retains. The deep ocean floor shares all of the same characteristics that the um, pelagic ecosystem above it has. So it's like cold, it's dark, there's a lot of pressure. However, there's one key difference um, between the deep ocean, like abyssal plain and the pelagic regions, and that is the presence of the bottom. So basically what happens is in the pelagic ecosystems above, if food falls past you, um, just out of range of you being able to detect it, that food is gone you can never get it. However, the deep sea floor, the food falls to the bottom and it stays there until something finds it. So these fish have more of an opportunity of finding food um, with the bottom because they can, it'll stay there until they can actually find it. So we do still have a lot to learn about the deep sea floor. We haven't sampled very much of it um, and we, will, we have been to the deepest part of the Mariana Trench called the Challenger Deep. Um, <clears throat> but there's still a lot more to learn. So feeding in the deep sea benthos. Um, there's very little production that makes it all the way to the sea floor. Um, and this is like just what I said. So the benthic organisms have an advantage over the pelagic organisms because the food stays there rather than falling past. Um, and so, mo but most of the food that actually makes it to the bottom is indigestible. Um, so like it's like copepod shells, like the exoskeletons of things. And it, that's inedible to a lot of things until the bacteria actually decompose it. So bacteria are actually a huge part of um, the food chain in the deep sea benthic regions. So most of the deep sea floor is covered in this fine muddy sediment. And myofauna are actually going to be the most abundant organisms in the deep sea. So remember myofauna are animals that live in between the grains of sand. Um, so there's going to be tons and tons of myofauna. What they do is they go around and they eat the bacteria that are um, breaking down and decaying all of the dead detritus that made it to the bottom. Um, and th so they eat the bacteria and absorb any organic matter from the water. And then these myofauna 
um, are then eaten by other things. And so they're able to take the food that's available in the form of the bacteria and dissolved organic matter and pass it up to higher levels of the food chain. So they're an important step in the food chain. This picture just shows you like what the seafloor looks like. So you can see it's like that really fine, silty sediment, flat for the most part. Okay. Um, then you can have deposit feeders. Deposit feeders are actually um, the most dominant form of feeders um, in the deep sea. That's because everything falls to the bottom and stays there and deposit feeders will either be going around picking stuff up or they will be eating the dirt itself. So here's some different types of deposit feeders that you'll find. You have polychaete worms, crustaceans, bivalve mollusks, sea cucumbers, sea stars, brittle stars, also like sea urchins, those sorts of things. You do have some types of predators in the deep sea but they're pretty rare. Um, compared to like the deposit feeders and the types of things that will be um, predators in the deep sea are going to be things like sea stars, fish, squid, sea spiders, the tripod fish, etc. And earlier, um, like last cycle, I mentioned this concept of deep sea gigantism where basically you get a reversal of the small size um, and the deep water organisms that occurs like in the benthic environment. So basically you get giant things that live on the sea floor compared to like their small cohorts up in the in the water column. So like you'll pull up a you know a sea spider and it'll be 35 inches wide, right? Rather than, you know, just a couple inches. So we get this thing called deep sea gigantism. And the theory for like why this actually happens is because it's cold and it's dark and there's a lot of pressure down on the sea floor. So those, the cold and the dark slow down the life processes and so these creatures like live life in the slow lane basically and they live for a long time. So we found clams that we think might actually be a hundred years old. Okay, so they, the, the temperature and the pressure slow, life, d slow down life processes and cause these creatures to live for a long time. And then we also think that they have to live for this long period of time and get so big um, because they need to store up enough energy to reproduce. So basically the creatures that live down here on the bottom, um, the females have to create eggs that have yolks that are large enough to be able to, to support a larva um, all the way through its juvenile stage all the way until it's an adult and can like fend for itself. Because these creatures cannot like migrate to the surface waters where there's more food for them to to feed, um, to get food and grow. So they have to live for a long time in order to be able to reproduce. These are just some pictures of some types of things that you'll find in the deep sea benthic region. So the top left is the, this is the sea spider, tripod fish, two tripod fishes, and then our giant isopod. So occasionally you do have large pieces of food that will sink all the way to the bottom like a whale carcass like we saw in our Blue Planet video and they are called bait falls um, because they act as bait for all of the deep sea creatures. And so what happens is you get a series of um, animals that will come to the the bait fall and they come in like a certain order. Um, and amphipods are first and then you get fish that come after that. And the reason why that they can find their way to this, you know, piece of meat is because they have a really, really well developed sense of smell and so they're able to um, find the bait falls that fall to the to the sea floor. This picture just shows you a comparison between the different um, regions so of the ocean and like what the, the fish look like and their adaptations in order to survive in those habitats. And I gave you a handout of this. Um, so that you could have it. Okay, species richness versus species abundance on the abyssal plain. Um, we're going to talk about this for the different habitats of the abyssal plain, so it's probably a good idea that you know what these mean. Um, and species richness is just simply the number of different species present in an area. And then species abundance is the number of individuals of each species present. So species richness, let's say we have an area of 20 square feet on the abyssal plain and we say, okay, we've got, you know, um, 
a squid and we've got a you know a rat tail fish and we've got an amphipod okay and so that's our species richness the number of different species present in an area species abundance is the number of individuals of each species present so in that 20 square foot um, area of the abyssal plain we've got you know three squid and five amphipods and you know 20 rat tail fish so it's the number of individuals present the abyssal plain has a really high species richness but a low species abundance um, and we think that's probably because there's like the abyssal plain is huge so they're all just really spread out so there's a lot of different types of things but there's not very many of them how we actually sample the abyssal plain to kind of figure this stuff out um, we have blind sampling techniques where we can basically just drag or drop gear and we don't really know what we're gonna get we're you know we'll drop something to the bottom and pull up whatever's there um, and don't know what we're gonna get so we call it blind sampling we can also use an ROV or a remotely operated vehicle in order to be able to sample the seafloor and basically it's like a, a computer game kind of where um, somebody will be on a boat and the ROV will be in the water and they'll control the ROV from the boat. Um, and the main source of like sampling for an ROV is video. So they take video. And then you can also have manned submersibles like Alvin, which you saw in our video again. And manned submersibles will take people down to like the sea floor in order to be able to see what's there. And they will use manned submersibles in order to be able to collect samples or to put equipment down there, like set up a camera or something like that. Um, but the problem is you don't get very much bottom time um, in a manned submersible because it takes a long time to get down there. Here's just some pictures of some blind sampling techniques. So we've got dredges and sleds, okay, um, and the anchor dredge and the epibenthic sled, you just kind of like drop those to the bottom, pull them, and then see what's, pull them up and then see what's there. These are grabbers and corers, so you just send them down and they'll take like a core of the, of the sea floor or like grab, take a handful basically of whatever, whatever is there to see what's there. The pictures on the left, these are um, ROVs at the Titanic wreck. So you've got Hercules and Duncan at the Titanic. Um, and then on the right, that's the picture of Alvin, pictures of Alvin, the um, man submersible that can go all the way to the seafloor. These are the kinds of things that they see when they're down there. So again, the deep sea isopod, um, sea cucumber and tripod fish, and then this is the grenadier fish. Um, all of those things are found on the seafloor. And the way that we actually discovered that life processes occur very slowly on the deep, deep sea floor is through an accident. So basically what, what happened was um, Alvin was going to be going on a mission down to the seafloor, and there were three guys that were going to be going in. Um, to Alvin and going all the way down and one of them had put his lunch into Alvin um, so that they could eat while they were you know in there for hours and what happened was Alvin sank so they were putting Alvin in the water and um, luckily the three crew members got out but Alvin came off his hook and he sank all the way to the bottom with the guy's lunch inside of it um, it takes a lot a lot of time to be able to go and get all of the equipment that they needed to go and recover Alvin um, and so, and they needed to recover Alvin because it's an expensive submersible. So they went, got everything they needed, and then came back a year later and rescued Alvin. Um, and what they pulled up, when they pulled up Alvin, the guy's sandwich was actually in there in like perfect condition. And so the, it was like obviously a little bit, um, you know, soggy, but it, they still were able to be, uh, like it was able to be recognized as the sandwich. Um, and so what they found was that the low temperature and the high pressure actually decreases the bacterial metabolism, it slows it down. And this is actually how they discovered that the life processes on the sea floor um, happen a lot slower than we thought. And this definitely led to our reevaluation of dumping trash in the deep sea, because at that point we thought, you know, hey, we'll just put it in the deep sea and it'll be fine. Well, it wouldn't be that trash would like never decompose because the processes happen so slowly in the deep sea. So it was a good thing that that happened. This is a picture of the Alvin sandwich. It's just got black dots on it because it's a poor quality picture, but um, that's the recovered sandwich. So it looks basically the same, which is kind of disgusting.